Matters of Indifference is the title of the message today. To eat meat that has been offered to idols, to have a glass of wine, some alcoholic drink, to mark one day as more sacred than another, to wear a suit to church instead of jeans, to pray all night long or even to get up before sunrise to pray. These, we would argue, are matters of personal preference. There are no moral or biblical imperatives to insist that these things need to be practised or even practised in the same way. Yet people will argue till they're black and blue in the face as if those matters are matters of life and death. You know, we all have religious sensitivities that may differ one to another. And these are matters that stem from the conscience and the convictions of each individual Christian. And of course, depending on your background, there can be divergent opinions about certain religious scruples. Should a Christian never be around a person who uses foul language? Will that pollute you? Will that pollute a person if that person stays in contact with them? Now, some Christians feel very strongly about needing to absent themselves from such language, whereas other Christians, you know, it's like water off a duck's back. Well, this message today goes to the heart of a person's convictions, to the heart of how Christians need to accept one another, even though they disagree on matters of indifference. The popular saying of many is this. No doubt you've heard it before. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, Liberty in all things love. And the main point is that when it comes to matters that have neither biblical commands nor moral commands backing them, we should accept and respect one another's opinions. There are two matters specifically addressed in this passage today. Firstly, the eating of meat. And the second one is about Sabbath days. These are great sources of disagreement amongst Jewish and Gentile Christians. You see, the heart of the matter is how Jews and Gentiles can actually live together as Christians, as brothers and sisters in Christ, in light of the sensitive matters of which they disagree. The strong... Paul talks about here, are predominantly Gentile Christians, whereas the Jewish Christians are in fact referred to as the weak. Now, the first thing we need to recognise is that designating Christians as either strong or weak is no reflection on their acceptance with God. That is very clear in verse 4. As Paul writes there, who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Now, of course, you won't find the Apostle Paul talking about the strong or using that word in this passage. But it's certainly implied, isn't it? Strong is the opposite to weak, I guess. But he does specifically say the word strong at the beginning of the next chapter, chapter 15. But then we need to recognise or realise who are the strong and who are the weak. What is this all about? Well, as I said in the introduction, this has to do with either abstaining or eating from meat, of meat. And the other one is actually treating each day as the same or... For someone instilling one day with more sacred significance than another. Now, the weak are said to be weak in faith 
and are most likely, as I mentioned before, identified with Jewish Christians who have not been able to separate themselves adequately from the law of Moses as for them being the governing factor of all their life. That's how it was. The law of Moses governed everything. But now they've come to know Christ and they're not under the law. But it's hard to separate yourself from your past. When you have a history, you know what it's like. It's hard to remove yourself from that history. Even though we know Jesus said all food is clean, Paul, who also, he's a Jewish Christian and he would be one of the strong, he also has said all food is clean on the proviso that it's eaten to the glory of God. But you have Jesus and Paul saying all food is clean. As he says here in verse 14, I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing in itself is, is unclean. But to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So you think about Gentiles. They never had the background, did they, into the law of Moses? They're not hamstrung by the law of Moses from eating meat of all kinds. They had no drama with that. You know, it's like many things in life, isn't it? We do them because that's what, how it's always been done. Why do you do it? Well, we've always done it that way. You see, we, we stick to history quite often, whether it's right or wrong, whether we've thought about it or not. We do it because that's how we've been brought up or that's how we have lived life. And honestly, I think we're shackled in more ways than we care to admit. And this being the case... We are required to understand each other better and out of love recognise that others are on a journey different from ours and are still working things out for themselves. Being vegan, vegetarian for the week was not for the purpose of looking slim, it wasn't the purpose of dieting. It wasn't the purpose of looking fit. Nor is it because they believed that killing cattle was wrong. The most likely background to this issue over meat is that in such an idolatrous society as that of Rome, meat offered to idols in sacrifice were actually sold to the local meat markets for sale onto the general public, you see. You had no way of knowing if that meat that you bought at the local supermarket had been previously offered to an idol and then therefore was polluted. Furthermore, you find the law of Moses spelt out that certain kinds of meat were unholy. It spelled out certain particular ways to slaughter an animal. The blood of an animal, for example, had to be drained or else the meat would be unholy. It also had to be cooked in a certain way. That was found in the law of Moses. Certain types of meat was forbidden and classed as unclean or unholy. For example, the pig. You know, we've got this, this beautiful ham for Christmas. The Jew would not eat meat like that, would not eat the pig. The camel, the horse, were all unclean. Remember how the Apostle Peter, he saw that vision from God of all that unclean animals lowered down in a sheet from heaven to the ground and that voice from God saying, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Remember what Peter said? Let's follow it through here in Acts chapter 10. So he saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered on the four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the sky. A voice came to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Again, a voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. 
And this happened three times, and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. Now, while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision which he had seen might be, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate. So then after pondering what this vision meant, he actually goes to the home of this Gentile, this Gentile man, Cornelius, and Peter makes this statement. He says to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner, that is a Gentile, or even to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. So what God has deemed clean is clean. But from this, we can see very clearly just how important it is for a Jew to avoid anything that was unclean or unholy. And we can see here that meat was certainly one aspect of that. You see, this was a big issue for the Church of Rome, where Gentiles who had no background in Judaism could simply say, it's just a slab of meat. <laughs> you know, it's just a slab of meat. But the Jew would have huge reservations conceiving meat in that same way. I don't care. It's just a piece of meat. I don't care. You can go vegan if you like. You see, that is the sort of attitude that the Gentile Christian was to have to his Jewish brother. If he just says it's just a slab of meat, then just be it that he can be vegan. Take the same laissez-faire attitude towards him. But what was happening was that the strong, the Gentile Christian who was free to eat meat, whatever he likes, and who understood that he was not under the law, that Jesus pronounced all food clean, was looking at contempt upon his Jewish brethren. Now, contempt means that you have no regard for the other person. You uh, have no respect for them. You even look down on them. You despise them for their weakness. The strong may think something like this. That Jewish brother of ours, really, seriously? He is pathetic. He needs to get over his past legalism. Get on with the liberty that we have in the gospel. But you see, that's not going to help him. And it's certainly not going to help the relationships in the church. These really are matters of indifference now. Just like the colour of a carpet in a building. It's a matter of indifference. It meant a lot to the Jews. They had a past. They had hangovers there. They had baggage baggage but the bottom line is food is irrelevant now jesus said all food's clean it's an irrelevant issue now we are not under the law so if the jew wants to keep it he's saying here show love and respect towards that person who's in that situation have a little tolerance for them now of course it's very different if they are insisting that you must practice these things to be saved. I mean, a group of them did that in the churches of Galatia and Paul came into great dispute with them because it went to the heart of the gospel, the heart of what it meant to be in a right relationship with God. And there he was in sharp dispute with them, even saying an anathema to even an angel that would preach a gospel different from the one that he proclaims. See, it's not a matter of, oh, if you abstain that, you know, you're not saved or that other people are not saved. It's just a matter of their preference. It's not about salvation. On the other hand, what about these Jewish Christians, the weak? What was happening is that they were therefore judging the strong. Imagine one of the week watching a, a strong Christian woman, a strong Gentile Christian woman going to the local Safeway uh, shopping centre in uh, Rome 
in the marketplace there. And, and, and the Jewish ladies are, are looking at this, uh, this Gentile Christian, free to eat whatever meat she wants and to buy whatever meat she wants, and they, they would be going, tisk, tisk, tisk. What is she doing? What is she thinking? You see, in that person's mind, she is a compromiser. She is a compromiser, a person who's putting her stomach before God. And so the Jews were judging the Gentile Christians for doing this. But the apostle insists that the woman who buys the meat should be accepted by the Jewish person who prefers to abstain. And the reason? God has accepted her. He has accepted both groups. And that, for us, is the key. God is the one, you see, who decides who is acceptable to him. And I think the bottom line here is that some people, in fact, have not grown in their faith to the level of accepting the truth as it is in Jesus. And, you know, if we don't make allowances for such people in where they are at with God, then, you know, we're all the poorer for it because we have all been at that stage ourselves at some point or another in our walk with God. We have been immature and we've been a child and we need to grow. This is not saying that anything goes, you can do whatever you like. It has to do specifically with matters of indifferences, not biblical commands, nor moral imperatives, just matters of indifference. So look at how the Apostle Paul puts this in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Because they had the same problem in Corinth. Therefore, Concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, specifically meat he's talking about here, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom are all things, and we exist for him and one Lord Jesus Christ by whom are all things and we exist through him. However, not all men have this knowledge, but some being accustomed to the idol until now eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled. But food will not commend us to God, neither uh, uh, we are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. The person's conscience is defiled, he says, because as far as that person is concerned, they did the wrong thing by eating meat that in their mind was unclean, having been sacrificed to an idol. So can you see the dilemma for these people? See, it doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong. It doesn't matter about that. It matters because in the mind of that person, it was wrong. In their mind, it was wrong. So in their mind, they are doing the wrong thing and sinning against God, whether it's right or wrong, if they do that, you see? So it goes to the heart of our motives. What we do, we do unto the Lord. Now, this leads me to talk about that great film of the early 1980s called Chariots of Fire. Not sure if you remember it. Quite a good film. Eric Liddell, he was the, uh, the great Scottish sprinter. He later, became a mission, he later was a missionary uh, to China, but he was a great Scottish sprinter and he was scheduled to compete in the Paris Olympics of 1924. But his race was scheduled to be run on a Sunday. Eric and his family believed in a Christian Sabbath, a Christian Sabbath day, which meant that such a thing could not be done on a Sunday. Was that a problem biblically? No, 
It wasn't, but in Eric's mind, it was a problem. And so for him, it was not right for him to run on a Sunday. So for him to do that on a Sunday would, in fact, be a sin against God because in his mind and his heart, he would be saying to himself, I would sin against God if I run. So then if he did run in his heart, what has he done? He has voluntarily consented to sin against God because he thinks it's wrong. Because he did it, it became wrong because he's actually defied God in his mind. He's voluntarily defied God by doing it. Even though there was, you know, for a strong person, every day it was the same. But for him, he was molded by the fact that Sunday was a Sabbath day for him. So to do that, which you think is wrong, actually becomes wrong. It becomes a sin against God. What would you say then about his belief? I would say good on him for staying to his convictions because he did not run that race. He didn't run. He was favourite for the 100 metre sprint to win it. He actually didn't run it. But they rescheduled and made it possible for him to run in the 400 metres through that week. And they said he'd never win it because that was not his race. He was a sprinter. But he sprinted and ran the whole 400 metres and he won the gold. It seems that God honoured him for what he, the convictions and, and the stance that he made, even though it was an in, a matter of indifference. So Paul writes here that, uh, you know, the person who wants to see every day alike with no special notoriety, then fine. If you have a special day, a sacred day like the Sabbath, then fine. These are matters, he says, now are indifferent. Of course, I think we need to instruct people in the truth. But if they are weak in conscience and faith, we don't reject them. We don't write them off because they haven't as yet grown in their heart and mind to the point of the liberty of the gospel that we know of. Paul is trying to bring these two groups together. You see how he's doing it? Saying, accept one another. We're all on a journey. Allow each other the opportunity to grow. Colossians chapter 2, he says, Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things of which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. The important thing here is how these things are lived out. The repetition of verse 5 to 6 is really glaring. You notice there, verse 5 to 6, the word, uh, the phrase, for the Lord, is actually expressed three times. And giving thanks to God is expressed two times. So what we need to understand is that what we do, we do for the Lord. So someone who keeps the Sabbath, for him, he's doing it for the Lord. Someone who says, every day is the same to me, they're doing it for the Lord. And they give thanks to God for that. You see, the heart of idolatry is really a motive that just ignores God as our creator because the idolater neither gives thanks to God nor glorifies him. We can go right back to uh, Romans chapter 1 and Paul talks about this person here. He says, for even though they knew God, what did they not do? They did not honour him as God nor give thanks to him. They became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. See, our motives are so important. Our motives. So if someone, however, decides to sleep in on a Sunday morning, miss church, I dare say that's a different matter. I think that person would get a sharp rebuke from the apostle because liberty does not equal license. So again, in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So whatever opinion you have, preference you take, that's not a biblical nor a moral command, do it all to the glory of God. Do it for God. 
There are some important questions that people are asking about life today, out there, in our non-Christian environment. And they're really asking these questions about themselves and, and the reason they can't answer them is that they're lost. Who am I? Who am I? People are asking, who am I? How did I come to be here? What is my purpose? Three very important questions. And many people can't answer those questions. And life for them, therefore, becomes aimless. It becomes purposeless and, frankly, irrelevant. You wonder why people are having so much trouble out there in the world? Why there's so much trouble? Why they're so aimless, purposeless, irrelevant? Things are irrelevant. It's because they have not acknowledged God, have they? We had this uh, suicide prevention meeting that took place quite a number of years ago, right here in uh, Chuka Community Church. And it was run by a secular organisation. And they asked a question. There were 17 of us there in this group. And they asked the question to the 17 people here gathered. And here's the question. Have you ever seriously contemplated suicide and or made an attempt? There are only two people in the group who are Christian and who answered never. That means that there were 15 other people, the whole lot, either had seriously contemplated suicide and or made an attempt. You see, the Christian knows who he is, how he came to be here, and what is his purpose. And it makes all the difference in the world to who you are as a person. The reason you can't judge one another or look down on one another is that we belong to the Lord, you see. That's who we are. We belong to the Lord. We are the Lord's. Both the strong and the weak belong to the Lord. And there is no time in which Jesus is not Lord. When he was crucified, he is Lord. When he is raised from the dead, he is Lord. And you know, this is also true of us. There is no time in which Jesus is not Lord of the Christian. He is Lord when we die. He is Lord when we are alive. The issue is motive, isn't it? Both the strong and the weak do what they do because they're trying to please the Lord. Why did Eric Lydell choose not to run on the Sunday? Because he felt that was God's will for him. And he knocked back a race that he was favourite to win because he was conscious of his God. He was doing so unto the Lord to please Lord Jesus. Now, a person who cannot be bothered to get out of bed to come to church cannot claim to be doing this in order to please the Lord. Seriously. No person who knows the Lord could possibly buy into that. So there's a difference, isn't there? The choices we make can be quite important and impacting. As Os Guinness has written very well with, he writes, Choice today can always be casual, whereas the covenantal vow of faith is costly because we commit ourselves to Jesus and mortgage our very selves as we do so. We have chosen and we are committed. We have picked up our crosses and there is no turning back. We are no longer our own. Very true, isn't it? So we come to the fourth reason that we are to accept one another, one another's opinions on matters of difference, indifference, is that there is a day of judgment coming for the individual person. We go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul expresses that here as well. He writes to the the churches at Corinth, he says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Again, Paul says in our passage today, 
For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. What does this mean when it comes to making judgments on those who do not hold to your opinions? Say you hold that you should celebrate Advent season or Lent, church traditions, their church festivals. They have no biblical warrant but they're seen as a good idea to help Christians celebrate and worship the Lord. Should Christians who believe in Lent judge those who do not partake in it? Not at all. It's not a biblical mandate, is it? And the reason is that each Christian is going to have, a, have to give an account to him, of himself to God. That is the point. Likewise, for the one who doesn't believe in Lent, uh, should not look down on the one who wants to celebrate it, since it is done unto the Lord. Now, it is true that some people are almost as zealous for certain holy days as were the Jews. Some people would say, oh, heaven forbid if we miss Lent or if we don't celebrate it in the way we should. But it does not follow that they are rejected by the Lord for keeping something that is not required of them, biblically. I think it's important that subsequent generations, however, learn to distinguish between what is biblical, what is moral commands, moral absolutes of God, and the practices of the church. There's an important distinction that, that should be taught the two are not always identical. See, one of the problems that does come from the traditions and the practices of the church is that subsequent generations cannot distinguish between what they have grown up with and what is actually commanded by God. Often what a person grows up with actually becomes like a command of God. And if you do not do it, you're actually sinning against God. So what we're really to take from this passage today is that God does accept both the weak and the strong in faith. But we do have an obligation to keep growing towards being strong in the faith. But the bottom line is that we're all servants of Christ and we should not take the position of judge of one another. Because doing so actually usurps the role of God himself. He is judge. And we're not to be acting like God, are we, when we do this? So let me finish with a summary today. The weak, they're those who have trouble accepting the freedom of the gospel on matters of indifference. The strong are those who have unshackled themselves from the strictures of Judaism. But since we are all fallen, fallen people, and since we are all on a journey, provided we do all things to the glory of God, then we should accept and respect one another, even though we may not see eye to eye on disputable matters. The underlying motive, what is it out of today's passage? Is love for one another and love for the Lord our God.